Hey everybody out there, this is Sam Dennehy, or better known as Half-Ass Customs, and this is Half-Ass Presents, the podcast. Our guest tonight is Mike Buddy, all the way from St. Louis, and uh, you know him from What's Neat This Week and Facebook, and what he's better known for is his brilliant model car building and designing, making them look super cool. Um, Mike, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, how you got started in the hobby? Well, uh, I, I guess it goes back to when I was a kid. Um, you know, my first cars were l rubber cars that were about 143rd scale from Auburn Rubber Company. And uh, they had a bunch of generic models, but they had a 57 Plymouth and a 57 Ford Ranchero that were spot on little models. So those were always my favorite. And then uh, when I was six year years old, I got my first promo car, a 1960 Chevy from the Chevy dealer. And, uh, and then shortly after that, I got uh, three more promo cars and I started getting into matchbox cars too. Then when I was a, an, uh, 10 years old, I got a HO train set for Christmas and that kind of went with my matchbox cars. So I really started collecting those. And of course I got all the U S models that you could get because a lot of them were, were British models. Um, but they were still the only thing going, but I was always attracted to the ones that looked realistic and the ones that I could see on the street every day. And, uh, so that's how I really became a real modeler um, instead of just, you know, playing with toys. I, I think anyway, cause I like to recreate everything that I, I saw on the street every day. And that's, that's still the way it is now, except that my interest stops about 1980. After that, I, um, I consider everything pretty modern. I can't identify the cars or anything after that. So, uh, they all you know, look the same. <laughs> right. So we all have our niche, but yeah, that's, that's the uh, era I modeled too. I stopped in 1980. I really target 1978 because I like the, uh, the worn out bicentennial stuff from that's a couple of years old. And I like the uh, Conrail uh, paint outs, the train cars that were, had the uh, reporting marks painted out with a, roller real hastily done uh though there was a lot of that in the 70s there was a lot of fallen flags still a lot of old cars and there was a there's a lot of hl scale cars available right around the 77 78 model year so um i decided to model that and that's that's really what i try and focus on now so that's it that's awesome that's great mike so um when you get these cars um I know we've, I've been to your house and I've seen uh, your auto racks and looking at some of your auto racks, it looks like you've got tens of thousands of dollars worth of vehicles only just on the auto racks. So yeah. why don't you tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, I, I cast a lot of them in resin. So uh, to reproduce them for the auto racks, so they're not so heavy. And, uh, and then also, uh, in 1998, Walter's uh, Model Train Company put a book out about the auto industry, um, and, you know, about, about the relationship between the uh, railroads and the auto industry. And I did a chapter in that book about how to detail some auto racks and how to detail cars and stuff. And uh, rather than take payment in money, I took payment in vehicles. So I got a whole whole bunch of vehicles from that transaction all around that same era, you know, so, um, but I, I think resin casting is the main thing, man. If you can learn to resin cast, it's really not that hard to do. And it just opens up a whole new hobby and, and you can, you know, basically pour cars out of a bottle. It seems like, you know, right. So, yeah. Well, I haven't learned how to do that yet. And I even bought the kit you told me and it's still sealed in the box. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, life gets in the way, I know, but I guarantee you, once you take the step, you'll be so intrigued by it that you'll want to keep doing it and learn more. So it's just well, like a drug. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. I think that's going to 
be the difference between the 3D printing and the resin uh, making, I guess, when you make your own resin molds compared right. to 3D printing the design that's out there. Um, I'm wondering how much the resin, uh, the mold resin is going to stay compared to the 3D resin that's out there. Well, um, the 3D uh, prints, some of those served as masters for my auto rack cars that I did. Um, like I'm working on this one giant project now. I left it upstairs. I don't have it here where I can show you, but I'm working on uh, a, a train of 1978 Camaros and Firebirds. And the Camaro was a 3D print from uh, Mad About Cars on Shapeways. And I bought that and then I cast it and then I modified a couple of the castings to make three different versions of the same car, Z28, a Rally Sport, and a Berlinetta. And then I did the same thing with uh, the, everybody knows that uh, black real rides, a 78 Firebird, the black with the gold trim on it, everybody's got one of those. And, and I took one of those and modified it into three different body styles also. So wow, uh, the car. Yeah, everybody has that. It's the only Trans Am I have. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah, the 3D printing, you know, it's getting better and better, and and that that will serve as a master, and then you could go from there and uh, cast something in resin. You know, now I can't sell those cars because it's cat. It's a, a a copy of something that's directly that's made. You know, still available. So. I, it's okay if you do it for your own use though, you know, like I'm doing it just to fill up this train. So it'll be pretty right. neat. When it's well, um, next question, I guess, um, what brought you to the love of model building and, uh, when did you start modeling? Well, um, I guess around age 10, when I got that, um, uh, that HO scale train set, I started making buildings for it. My dad helped me uh, build, you know, set up a, a table, and then uh, I got the plastic, Plasticville buildings, at, which are Bachman now. But uh, I started building those, and then around the same time, I got my first car model kit that was 125th scale to go with the promotional cars that I already had, and uh, and then. By the time I was 11 or 12, I, I had built probably about 10 model cars, and I was still into matchbox cars. And then uh, I guess when I was about 14, it was 1967, I got my first uh, real HO scale uh, model. It was the, the Viking or Viking 22 Chevelle Malibu. It's like one of their rare American cars. And uh, okay. When I looked at it, and I, compared to my Matchbox cars, I was like, "Wow, this really looks a lot more realistic than the, you know, the Matchbox cars." So, that's what really got me started modeling in HO scale too. So, um, it's you know, it's always an eye for making something look more realistic than it than it already is, and uh, you know, or if oh, you want to make changes, you know. So, right. Yeah. Definitely. I mean. You can, like we've we've said before, you can you can buy a Hot Wheels off the off the shelf and it look all cartoony, or you can have something that you've made yourself that looks realistic and something you right. can see on the road today. Right. Or right. Back in nineteen seventy eight. Yeah, but uh, yeah, that's and that's where the three D cars you know really come in because you can have just about any vehicle you want and and. HO is a popular scale to print them in, but you can get them at other scales too. But uh, if your layout doesn't have a whole lot of cars, you can just you can get a few specialty cars just to really, you know, be different than everybody else. Because you see about the same twenty cars on everybody's layout. You know, it seems like yes, you do. Yes, and I think that's uh that's one of the downfalls of probably early modeling in this scale compared mm -hmm. to now but at the same time if you have the right people modeling it like you you can build so many different versions of that same car yeah. you know, right you have to do it so right. you could literally have 20 of the same exact cars but they all look completely different or not right. even completely different, 
but, but with, you know, yeah. With the subtlety. Yeah, with the paint, different colors, and uh, you know, different trim levels and stuff like that. Yeah, these uh, Camaros and Firebirds, yeah, they're all different factory colors, and it'll, it's going to be a pretty cool project. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking looking forward to loading those up on a train and running them by. But uh, I'll be showing them on the uh, 187th Vehicle Group scale model vehicles that one that we're in so right. I'll be yeah well even on the what's neat i've seen um some updated uh photos of what you've shown on there and they're just amazing i can't yeah. imagine building the that many of the same car yeah <laughs> i've come close with the 64 impala but not not actually close i've i've done probably 20 of those yeah, no near what you've built. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've got seventy-five of them all together, enough to fill six train cars, fifteen in each car, train car. So, uh, yeah, it'll be really cool, all different colors. So, yeah. Yeah. so that's uh, great. Yeah. Well, you you've said it in the past, and what's neat, but um, that auto rack behind you. Yeah, that? that's a one twenty-fifth scale. That's like. Uh, that's the scale of, you know, regular model cars that are about eight inches long. And that that's all scratch built. Um, and all the cars on it are uh, modified into different body styles from the AMT uh, Chevelle model or the AMT El Camino. And uh, I made some four doors. I had to do a lot of resin casting for those too, like... I made the flat hoods instead of uh, SS hoods, you know, flat Chevelle hoods and uh, flat bench seats with headrests. I made my own steering columns and I had to do a lot of uh, modifying on that too. But that's all part, part of being a modeler, you know, it's stuff we enjoy do, doing. So, but, right. Yeah, that, that big, exactly it. that thing took me uh, 30 years all, all together. I started it when, uh, before I was married, I started, I built the flat car and the, the uh, wheels to trucks and everything. And uh, the flat car was pretty well done with the cushion underframe. And then uh, marriage and kids came along and I, I put it on the shelf for like 25 years. But then finally in 2010, I got it out and finished the uh, auto rack itself and finished all those car models. So um, that's my biggest lifetime achievement so far model wise. <laughs> 30 years yeah i can imagine um yeah that's as long as i've been actually modeling for 30 years though so. yeah <laughs> I, can't, right. I can't believe uh i can't i can't understand well i can understand it but i can't uh imagine building some one project for that long yeah well it was, there was like a big 20 year break you know i'd get it out every once in a while and look at it and think yeah i had to kid take the kids to softball practice or whatever i always had something else to do you know and it was cool but uh yeah, it didn't really take me actually 30 years to build, but there was there was a big chunk, you know. Finally, when things kind of calmed down a little bit, I was able to uh, finish it. So, yeah. Now I'm working on a, a Vertipak in that scale. And I don't know if you guys know, but that's what the uh, Chevy Vegas were transported in. The sides folded down, and they would drive three Vegas on, onto a door, and then it would, the door would close up vertically. And the cars oh. rode vertically. So, so uh, I'd imagine that the car had to be empty of all its fluids. No, it they had, it was designed to be shipped that way. They had uh, special baffles in the oil pan and in the number one cylinder. And the uh, windshield washer was mounted at a 45 degree angle. They, they had everything designed so it could be, it would could survive they had plugs all the fluids were plugs so all they have to do is pull the plugs and uh and they could drive it right out so it's a pretty amazing thing yeah uh, i've only ever seen still pictures of of that never like a video of how it worked so that's yeah. neat i don't even know if there are any videos i've collected a lot of pictures of them but uh i started collecting vega models and i'm casting some of those too in in this same 125th scale so That'll that model. If I ever get it done, it'll be four feet long, and it'll it'll have thirty Vegas inside of it. So wow, we'll see. Well, that will be the prototype modeler's dream, right there. Yeah, Talk right. To you all night about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's pretty awesome, Mike. Um, 
it's cool to see that you started when you were 10 and you're still doing it today. Yeah. Um, I, I believe that that's probably something I'll be doing. I mean, I, like I said, I've been doing it 30 years straight, never mm. really stopped. Took a little pauses, yeah. a couple months right. here and there. But, right. Um, and then I just jump from scale to scale. So it doesn't, I never really stop. So I hope that like you, I'll be uh, modeling for as long as you have, because I mean, I love it. You love it. Yeah. People right. Into the snow or into the hobby of model building. Mm -hmm. They've got to love it too. That's why they still do it. So right. that's cool. That's I great. think the only time I ever really gave it up for a while was when I was like 17, 18 and I got, I had my own car and I got a, I was interested in girls, had a girlfriend and I started doing that kind of stuff. And then I think by about 23 or 24, I settled down and realized what was important in life, <laughs> cars and trains, you know, <laughs> and model buildings. Yes. Right. Yeah. Insane. <laughs> right. So. That's awesome, Mike. Well, um, I think that's, that's all I've got. Um, do you have anything you like to say? Um, I think I'm going to start doing end of videos. Maybe like, do you have any words of encouragement to new people that are well, just joining you? Yeah. Yeah. Just if you, if you like to build models, just keep on trying. Don't ever get discouraged. You know, um, my stuff really looked bad when I was a kid. I, you know, my first model that I got when I was 10 years old, I brush painted it flat red with a paintbrush and, and I made a huge mess on my desk and my pants and everything. And my mom wasn't real happy. And the model looked like hell, you know, but uh, I went from there and, uh, you know, uh, you, get, you just get better and better. You know, if it's something you really love to do, you, you'll naturally get better at it. You know, you can only progress the more you do it. So you don't even have to think about it you just automatically get better so right right that that's true um yeah. i've slowly come into to be better yeah 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 well mike um it was a pleasure talking to you i'm gonna i consider you a master modeler i don't know if that's what you consider yourself as but you're a master modeler in my book so well thanks i really appreciate that um you know, I just try and do my best and, and, you know, you just get a little better as you go, you know, but, uh, I just want to say how fun it was to meet you guys the last few summers when you came to St. Louis for the, uh, for the train show. And, uh, it was really cool hanging out with your, you and your dad and your family and stuff. And it's too bad that, uh, things got canceled this summer. I was looking forward to it again, but, um, maybe next year, right. you know, so. Uh, yeah, definitely next year. Definitely. I mean, with this year being so much of a bust, yeah, we're gonna be looking for the next show to go to. Well, for sure. So yeah, we're all Yeah. So anyway, I, I do believe though, for this scale and for this this hobby, there's only two major train shows or meets that I'll be going to, and that's the St. Louis RPM one and. Than the Amherst one in right in, in Massachusetts. Houston. Yeah, I don't see myself going to any other one. I I don't know. Right. Unless right. they want to fly me out there. Yeah. A special. Thing. Right. <laughs> I always hear that uh that Amherst show is is the you know by far the best one to go to. But man, I we can't afford to fly. My wife doesn't really like to fly anyway, so we'd have to drive, and that's it's always in January, and it's a bad time of year to be driving up east. You know, you never know what kind of weather you're going to run into. Right. It's, yeah, it's crazy. I know when we went the beginning of this year, um, it was due to rain the whole weekend and possibly snow. And no, man. We got up there, it was like yeah. in the mid-60s. And wow. I was like, when is it supposed to snow with it being 60? And, yeah. and it was the same temperature the whole entire weekend. And we brought snow gear. <laughs> so we weren't expecting that. <laughs> well, it's better to have it and not need it than the other way around, you know. Very true. Yeah. Well, Mike, this was a pleasure talking to you. I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Hopefully, 
um, soon, well, hopefully soon or in the near future, uh, we'll have you on again and uh, okay. see what you're up to. But until then, keep modeling and uh, enjoy. Thanks. Same here, buddy. Nice right, talk. Have a good night. See you, everybody. So long. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the record.